as well as Suhad Baba, Executive Director of Just Vision. Um, so just to start things off, I was just going to ask a couple basic questions for these two, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. And I just want to remind everyone that we're filming the Q&A, just so you remember. Um, but Amar, I'm going to start with you, because obviously this film is quite a unique film, both in terms of the storytelling and the techniques you use to tell the story. So maybe you could just tell us a little bit about how it even got started, because this is your first film, and maybe there's just some interesting stories about how it was conceived. Mm -hmm. Hi, thanks. Uh, thank you all for coming. Hello. Hello. That's better. No. Oh, maybe we'll borrow. We're gonna fix no. it. Just one second. Just start, just start, and okay. we'll, we'll fix it. Well, we'll fix it, okay. go ahead. Sorry, thank so, you. So, as I said in the film, I heard, I read the story in a comic book, uh, 1991, in, in Syria. And I was obsessed at that time by reading comic books about superheroes, uh, Superman, Tantan, Asterix. And one day I read this comic book about uh, my town, uh, about superheroes could be uh, my cousins or my uncles. And uh, I was so excited, that means in a way or another that uh, me myself can be a superhero, at least by blood. So I had this Im uh, image of utopian Palestine. When I came back to, to Palestine in 1997 after also this agreement, uh, I was shocked with the reality. It was so different than what I expected. Uh, one day I met one of the characters, Jalal, the, the, the bold guy who looks like Gandhi. And they told me that uh, uh, everything you imagined was true, but uh, you came at the wrong timing, and you missed it all. Mm -hmm. So in a way or another, making this film was a chance for me to live those moments again by interviewing those people, uh, 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 asking them all the, about all the details, and eventually to film everything on, on camera, to recreate all those uh, events, and animate those, and create the characters. And so it was for me a selfish uh, motivation at the beginning to, to, to live those beautiful times I missed by making this film. And eventually I noticed that all the, the characters, they had the same interest. Because uh, uh, we in asked each character to be interviewed to recommend somebody who looked like him 25 years uh, ago. So they would recommend their sons or her daughter or her niece, and they would bring that character to the set. and. Uh, they would come to the shooting uh, and give directions to their kids that I used to stand like this, or act like this, I smile, I stand uh, steady. So, and, and, and they were uh, very uh, into the, the shooting in a way that uh, you feel how much they were so happy by watching themselves uh, at, at a time when they loved what they were doing uh, most. Yeah. So that's it. Yeah. That's very, I think it's so interesting because I, I just want to ask one question and then we'll go to side. Did some of the people who were participating as the younger versions, did they know the story already? Or did some of them even learn certain things they didn't know from before? M most of them, they didn't know the story. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, that relationship between the parents and, and uh, the kids was quite also interesting. Like yeah. uh, uh, we had a few arresting scenes which didn't end up in, in the on, on the screen. But that was uh, quite uh, also emotional, uh, and uh, for example, shooting the, the scenes with Anton uh, was also very emotional. Uh, all of his family came to see uh, Anton alive again on the screen from a distance. So uh, it was also like uh, on the set, it was kind of uh, a course of what happened in the Intifada. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and part of the reason I asked about did certain younger ones learn things they didn't know before is sort of a little bit about what I wanted to ask Suhad to share um, sort of a couple basic points in that we were talking before about a lot of Human Rights Watch's research on this region very much relates to the rule of law. And there's a, a situation where you have certain military orders that virtually make it impossible to have lawful protests. And so there's sort of two things going on here in that a lot of this history is suppressed. A lot of times, I know I've been at other screenings of the film where people were surprised. They've never heard this story. They've never heard of this type of resistance. And so that's very interesting and telling, you know, just in one sense. But then also the bigger picture of how this type of protest or these things are little known because of a whole legal structure and a set of military orders that exist. So 
there's a bit of a campaign that you're working with, but maybe you could sort of address those two things and then we can bring it back to the film and open it up. Absolutely. Um, and first of all, thank you all for turning out tonight. Um, and a special thanks to the Human Rights Watch Film Festival for having us and ensuring that this very important story um, is making it to audiences in London. Um, just a little bit of background about Just Vision so that you have context about who we are and how we step into this conversation. Um, we're a team of human rights advocates, conflict resolution experts, filmmakers, and journalists who have been using disruptive media, um, most traditionally in the form of documentary films such as Budrus, which was hosted <laughs> by the Human Rights Watch Film Festival a couple of years ago, um, but also more recently news sites and graphic novels. Um, where we highlight the work of Palestinian and Israeli human rights defenders, community organizers, activists, those very individuals who are oftentimes arrested and punished um, under the military law framework um, that Andrea makes mention to. Um, and the work that we do at Just Vision is addressing the challenge that we're, we often see in the mainstream media where there is actually not a um, lack of stories, but rather a saturation of stories on Israel and occupied Palestinian territories that often forms um, are, are, are framed in the form of violence, extremism, um, law and order, criminalizing any behavior that challenges the existing status quo of occupation and inequality pervasive in the region. Um, and instead of highlighting those change makers on the ground, those activists, those communities who have been resilient and who have been working to do, um, to, to change the balance of power and to, to strive for freedom and equality in the region. Um, so in about the, over a decade of the work that we had been doing, um, we have come across, worked with, and in coordination with co community organizers and activists, um, both Palestinian and Israeli, who had um, time and time again told us about stories from the First Intifada, um, stories of heroism and courage um, that we, f we felt was very important. And in most recent years, uh, many of these activists, many of this, these community organizers, as they're facing increased repression um, under um, military law, um, Israeli policy um, that squashes these movements, mm -hmm. um, and as they're also thinking about what is the next phase of this movement, how do we change the dynamics on this issue, mm -hmm. um, they were um, craving and really um, seeking to better understand what did the first intifada look like? What were the strategies and tactics being tried? Um, can those lend any um, lessons learned to our movement building today? And so we listened. So we began to research the first intifada, and we are now into our second year of research um, to unpack what has been a very complex legacy. Um, and in particular, you know, today many international and I would say mainstream international audiences and certainly Israeli audiences, when we think about the first intifada, oftentimes the first images that come to mind are those iconic ones of Molotov cocktail throwing, of violence, of clashes, and yet 97% of the activity during that period, during the Palestinian uprising, was actually unarmed in the form of marches and sit-ins and boycotts. Um, in building parallel institutions within Palestinian society that would render Israeli governance of occupied Palestinian territories obsolete and unnecessary. Um, very much so like what you see in the Wanted 18, where an entire community galvanizes not for one day or two days, a week or even a month, but years um, in self-reliance tactics um, for independence and in a larger struggle struggle for freedom and equality. And so when we learned <coughs> the work that Amr is, was doing, um, along with Ina Fishman and Dar Films, um, with the National Film Board of Canada, we were really excited to come on board to help ensure that this story um, makes it to international audiences, particularly um, in the United States, um, to challenge the, the common narrative um, that what is taking place in the occupied Palestinian territories, what these marches and protests are, are riots and clashes. In fact, they're not. They're, in, they're part of a larger freedom struggle, and it's a real pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. So I think that gives people a little bit of background and context, but of course we know you have questions, and we do have a mic, so if you'd like to ask a question, you can just put your hand up and we'll bring you the microphone so that we can all hear your question. And um, I know there's always a first question to break the ice. I can certainly ask more, but I'm sure there must be some questions for Amr as well as for Sihad. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. I see one hand. Right there. Yes, thank you. 
Thank you. I, I want to know if the, the film was shown in Israel and what was the reaction of Israeli people, basically? Sort of. Uh, we screened the film all over historical Palestine. So we screened in Jerusalem, Haifa, uh, Bethlehem, uh, Gaza. Uh, I don't know if uh, you know, we didn't get any official reviews in the Israeli media. So I don't know if they saw the film, which is uh, better. We got a few requests from Israeli film festivals, uh, Jerusalem film festivals, and we uh, said no. So basically, I don't know if they saw the film or not yet. but. Uh, I think so. The film will be pirated in way or another, so <laughs> to be seen for a Thank you. We'll just pass the mic then. Thanks a lot. I'll be at the end of the row. Um, was there a particular meaning behind why you chose like a white background for the Israeli contributors and like a black background for the Palestinians? Uh, <coughs> I wanted the Palestinian interviews to be uh, intimate and uh, of course because we have very many visual elements like I just have seen, the, we have animation, we have uh, archival footage, we have uh, like almost six uh, visual styles in the film, like a salad plate. So we wanted to eliminate as much as possible of things. So we had the blank background. For the Palestinian I wanted the the uh, an intimate feeling where you have uh, a small spotlight as if he's talking to you in person. Uh, for the Israelis, I wanted more something like an uh, uh, interrogation situation. I wanted to have this harsh lighting uh, <coughs> where you have uh, more uh, confrontation with the questions and the way of uh, you get mm -hmm. the answers rather than a normal character like the others. I wanted to make the because in, in, in general, the, the difference between the two languages is not clear, so I wanted to make visual clarity between who are you listening to. Yeah. Interesting, yeah. That comment has come up in other conversations, sometimes differentiating between Hebrew and Arabic. A lot of people... <coughs> Just to say on the visuals, uh, two questions. Uh, one about the use of archives. Uh, where where's the footage from? How you, yeah, it's amazing that you're able to see people now and then from Beit Sahur. And the second one is about the use of animation in dealing with such issues, basically. Um, yeah, what, what what does that mean, and how does that help or maybe not help actually mm -hmm. get um, the message of the call? One of the challenges we had in the f in this film. Uh, <coughs> That the, uh, the archives, because m most of the archives we have about the first intifada was shot by uh, international news agencies, which uh, were the only allowed people to, to film in, 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 in general. So you'll have an archival footage either pro-Palestinian, where they have the, the way they see the Palestinian as a, a victim, either killed or in, or uh, pro-Israeli, where you have uh, the Palestinian terrorist mass and throwing stones or whatever. But you'll never find uh, a cameraman from a news agency who will film a Palestinian planting his backyard or milking a cow. Or, uh, they are not interested in those kind of stories. So when we started working on this film, uh, since we are telling an alternative story, uh, we didn't find any archive uh, footage uh, related to our story directly. So <coughs> when the people in Beth Sahur knew that we are doing uh, this story, they started to provide us with uh, personal home videos. Uh, people visited them and they have a, a footage of their visit. So you will have uh, uh, most of the archives we use are uh, home videos and things they they taped from news agent uh, from TV channels when they see themselves mm -hmm. in there somewhere. They so they taped it. So we had many of home videos from the people mm -hmm. and the animation. And the recreation parts came very essential here to recreate your own archives as if you had the chance to to film whatever you want to represent yourself visually in the first mm -hmm. intifada. So basically, we recreated our personal archives, which we didn't have the chance to do it in the first intifada, <coughs> because obviously we were not allowed to 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 film yeah. ourselves or shoot ourselves. And actually, I might ask Suha to jump in a little bit because one of the things we were talking about, and it relates to what you're talking about, 
the media and, and the lack of footage or the footage that does exist is always shot from a certain perspective or a certain point of view. And I think one of the aims with the Just Vision project and the campaign is to show this bias, for lack of a better term. I don't know if you want to elaborate on that, but I think your explanation of the archives is so illustrative mm -hmm. of that situation and just what you would find. Absolutely. Um, so on the first intifada, my team has conducted a couple of bodies of research. Um, one is looking at um, and interviewing Palestinian leadership from across the um, period of the first intifada, both those leaders that were in exile, the PLO exile leaders, as well as those who were the local grassroots organizers, those very people who were forming the popular committees, as you see in Beit Sahur, um, and forming the backbone of the movement on the ground. The second body of research is actually interesting and intersects with this question of the media. We looked at the Israeli mainstream media coverage of the first intifada um, from the beginning and the outbreak of the, the intifada in eight, 1987 um, through for the first two years. And we were interested um, in understanding to what degree the law and order framework that we see applied today by the Israeli military um, in the occupied Palestinian territories held up in the way in which the Israeli mainstream media tell, told the story of the first intifada. In other words, today what we often see, like was the case in Budrus, which was the first Palestinian-led successful um, unarmed campaign to force the Israeli government to change the route of the separation barrier. When that campaign was taking place for 10 months, it took place in 2003 to 2004, the little me media coverage that it did receive, when it did receive media coverage, was again framed within the, the, the um, lens of violence and clashes criminalizing Palestinian behavior. And we were interested in whether this was also true during the first intifada. Um, so we hired an Israeli uh, journalist to research this question, and when we brought him on board, he was skeptical initially. He said, you know, that was actually the heyday of pluralism in Israeli society. This was the heyday of mainstream media in Israel. Um, and I don't think it was as bad as it is today. And it, that's great. We wanted someone who was a bit skeptical to come on board. Um, and he ended up looking at headline by headline, photo by photo, story by story to understand what were the, um, the frames of the conversation, what were the photos, who were they depicting, um, what did those images look like, and what did the, when did they cover stories. And what we saw was that it was incident by incident. So when there was a violent outbreak, there was a story. When there was a Molotov cocktail thrown, there was a story. When you look at the actual sources cited, the few times that they actually cited Palestinian sources, it was co consistently in the frame of, as Palestinians claim, um, they wouldn't actually cite the, the individual who spoke. Um, and even the frame of, as Palestinians claim, undermines the legitimacy and the credibility of that individual as a source. Um, and coming off of that first uh, initial phase of research, we were interested then in speaking with Israeli journalists. There were, top, there were 12 top correspondents who were covering this issue um, on the ground. Many of those journalists today are editors um, for top Israeli mainstream outlets today, Channel 2, Channel 10, and top, as, as well as papers. And what they shared with us was, look, if you thought it was bad then, it's even worse today. Um, and so I think that paints an illustrative picture of you know, the type of, um, of, of stories that are being captured within the Israeli public. But if we also look at the international media coverage during this period, it was much better in the first year of the Intifada than it um, was later on. And so there was some coverage of um, the subsistence gardens, the alternative educational schools that were set up by Palestinians in response to the Israeli military iron fist policy, which closed down um, public schools, which closed down any form of Palestinian um, organizing and independence. Um, and what we saw over time, however, was that as the Intifada um, wore on, the international media either lost interest, so they stopped telling these stories, or they actually started adopting the framing of riots and clashes as we actually moved along the way. Mm -hmm. I want to bring it back to a story, but I'd like to see if there are other questions. Yeah, I know there's hands right here. I was very interested in the interviews with the Israeli officials. There were echoes there of the gatekeepers, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe that was deliberate, I don't know, and the heads of Shin Bet talking to camera. So my question was, was it difficult to get them to speak in this particular context, and do you think they regretted it afterwards? Mm -hmm. 
uh, it was impossible to get them. <laughs> so we submitted like uh, over the first three years of working on the same code, this one took five years. So we kept up applying uh, to get an interview and an access to the Army archives. We wanted a copy of the photos they had, the uh, uh, cows chasing reports and stuff. <laughs> and they kept rejecting the film. I think they get the idea of how you know, the position of the film. So basically, then we submitted <coughs> another application as a Canadian film. As a Canadian film uh, about general stuff. And uh, we sent the Canadian crew from Canada and we had uh, pre written questions. Among them are the questions we have in the film. And uh, so it's basically trick and treat. And <laughs> we got the question. I don't know the response yet. I don't know legal wise what is our situation. But he will hear. Why I'm not yeah, I'm very anxious to see and to show them the film. <laughs> 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 right. um, thank you, Anna, for such a wonderful film. I'm so moved and inspired by it. My question is two parts. The first one, how was your film received by the Palestinians? And how was it received by the region Libichi, that is the Palestinian Authority? Mm. Mm. Uh, the people in general <coughs> were very excited. Uh, like we did the main, the, the premiere in uh, Ramallah, and we were expecting 400 people to come. Uh, eventually, we ended up with 1,300 people coming to, to our premiere, which was bigger than what we expected. Uh, uh, they didn't want to leave after the screening. They wanted to talk and chat, and uh, and everyone wanted to tell his story, and they thought that it's. Uh, so people start to come to me and tell me that we have a story about donkeys and we have a story about this <laughs> and that. It's like going to make another film. And people were very happy to, ha to see that uh, this kind of heroism uh, is on the big screen. Because after the, the, the also agreement, something went wrong. Uh, uh, during the first intifada, we value as a human being, as a Palestinian, we come from how much do you give to your community, how much uh, creative you are, how much do you suffer for the others. And after the peace agreement, uh, your value will come from how much do you have in the bank or how much, how, what kind of car you are driving. So, and, and the, the heroes, the people who are becoming the, uh, in power and the officials and the representative of the Palestinian people abroad, started to be n n not among those people who sacrificed in the first intifada. They are different people. So they felt uh, that they were worth nothing. And when they saw this film, every one of them, even th if they are not in the film, everybody who went through similar experience started to feel that he is a superhero again. Mm -hmm. So uh, for them, it was, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, they were uh, so happy. The PA level uh, also, uh, the Israelis didn't have any reviews, the PA had, you know, as if the film didn't have happen even. We invited them for uh, a special uh, uh, premiere in Bet Sahod, but none of them came. So the municipality, the ministry, none of them. So uh, I think they are busy with more important stuff. <laughs> No comments. Mm. No comments. Um, I just wanted to thank you. It's a comment, really. I just wanted to thank you for a fantastic film. Um, I've watched It's Inevitable. When you come to a festival like this, you're slightly preaching to the converted um, with your film. So what I love about your film is that I've watched countless films about the Palestinian situation that are incredibly painful to watch the first time in a very, very long time I've seen anything that uh, is so full of joy, as well as obviously the sadness of um, life under occupation. But um, I just wanted to say thank you for actually making a film that might engage with a, a wider audience than would normally come to watch a film about the Palestinian situation. Thank you. I just want to saw another hand. You have to raise it kind of high because the light's here, but I just want to saw somebody else. But I think, um, just to go back to one other thing, I, I do, I remember 
Well, I saw this film in Toronto, but it does sound like when the people who were in the film actually saw themselves <coughs> on the big screen, that was a big, just just this, I guess, I mean, for lack of a better term, counter-narrative. And, and I'm curious, did any of them have comments on some of the artistic choices with the animation, or did they participate in some of those sort of conversations or decisions <coughs> about other parts of the film that they weren't directly involved in with the reenactments, or was that not the case for them? I'm just curious. They gave you any artistic feedback as well as factual? Uh, uh, artistic regarding the animation, uh, not really because we did the animation in Canada, so they didn't see it. I think okay. if, they, if they saw it, they would have their say in the thing. <laughs> but, but actually, they get involved almost in every stage uh, in, in the film, and they almost hijacked the film. Like, <laughs> at some point, we, we lost control. Like we were sh shooting a scene in the street, somebody would pass by, ask what you are doing, and we are looking for the film about the cows and, and, and the antifather, and they will tell you a story happened to him just across the street where we are shooting. And it's a really interesting story. We didn't come through in a, in across the story while we were doing the research. And we look at each other, me and the co-director and the team, and we say, it's my story, let's shoot that. So we stop shooting this and <laughs> we shoot whatever you told us now. And people will start telling us story along the line. So we were supposed uh, to shoot nine days, and we kept shooting for uh, two weeks because people started to come up with more stories and interesting stories. Uh, and when I said uh, they were kind of directing the, the actors, because me, uh, I was not in, in the Antifada, so I don't know that much of details about how the arrest will work, for example. So we we'll ask the actors to come and the soldiers, and you'll we'll get from here, you'll we'll arrest the, the, the guy and take him out of the bed. And it works for me. On, on camera, it, it, looks, it looks fine. And then they will come and they will say, but this is not how it works. <laughs> this is not how it happens. I say, I've never been arrested, so they, I ask them to show me. And they will take it from the scratch. The, the, the actor will lay in the bed sleeping. The soldier will be outside. And the guy the, the, will, will come out of the bed. Action, and they will go back. So <laughs> 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 but there's no need for me on the set. Anymore. <laughs> they will shoot the things. They will write the scenes. They it, it kind of we gave them a platform to to represent themselves in a way, to write the script, to act, to direct, to record it, to, to casting directors, to bring the actors who wanted them to play the roles. In a way, they, they literally hijacked the film. In some places, they were uh, very helpful, even on the production level. Like a day before our shooting, uh, the army uh, came in the great uh, town, and they arrested our props master. So they took the military jeep uh, props that we were supposed to shoot with, and the plastic guns, which we were supposed to shoot with. And uh, we ended up with no uh, soldiers uniform. And uh, the people in the Sahur, they uh, started making phone calls, and uh, they brought uh, a civilian jeep that looks like the army jeep, and they painted it. And they brought it to the set, and they said that will solve the problem. Here you go. And uh, uh, our production manager was uh, thinking, what can he do in 24 hours? And the people took over, and they find a way. Uh, uh, this is what was amazing in shooting this film, that uh, Whenever they felt that somebody or you know, a group of people are appreciating what they did, they were ready to jump back to the same spirit of the antifada, of the collective who can make phone calls and solve problems and, and yeah. uh, give a hand. And, and, and that was amazing. Uh, our co-director, the Canadian co-director, is quite old guy, like 60-something. And, and, uh, and he's, he's uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, and he did like uh, around 35 films in his life. And he's well experienced. Uh, worked all of his life on the National Film Board of uh, National Film Board of Canada, and he and did many films. And this is my first film. And uh, the the whole production was quite s uh, spectacular. About uh, uh, we are shooting in Palestine, in the sense, for example, when they started recommending the DOP director of photography to, sh to the cameraman, they started recommending cameraman who shot inside a volcano or uh, in the North Pole for, for uh, six months. So this is how they thought about Palestine. So eventually, uh, the, the, the cameraman and the co-director came uh, to, to Palestine, expecting to shoot in a very miserable situation. and. Uh, Whenever we are pointing on any balcony, say, for example, I wish we can put the camera up there, 
within a few seconds, the camera will be up there, the door will be open, a glass of water will be in his hand, and uh, uh, this is, uh, it looks, and he looks like a nice character. I wish we can use him in the film. And in a minute, he's in the set, dressed, and then he, and he said, I've, uh, I've done 35 films, but this is the first time I feel that I'm shooting in the biggest studio in the world, where everybody is an extra, every place is a, is a location, and everything is possible. I, I mean, we don't have equipment, for example, in this thing. We don't have cameras, we don't have any, very little lighting. But on the ground, you have uh, a community who can do miracles if they are uh, convinced uh, in the cause. Mm -hmm. yeah. so those are some great examples. I hope people, that's very enlightening. Um, but I just was, we just have like a couple of minutes. I don't know if there's one last question, perhaps. Yes, I see one hand. Thank you. Um, this is um, one of the um, uh, brilliant illustrations of um, a harrowing and at the same time courageous story of resistance to injustice. I wonder, on a broader level, do you personally see for the people any light at the end of the tunnel? <laughs> um. There must be a light at the end of the tunnel. Must be, but do you see it? Not, not now, not at the moment. <laughs> but I think, uh, as, as I said, I believe in a white cow in a cave. I, I, in, I see it in my heart, not, not at the moment. And, and uh, uh, to be honest, I don't think we can do it alone. Like, uh, it's, uh, things are very hard on the ground. So, uh, and in, any, in other cases, like South Africa, for example, it didn't happen by itself. Like the people there were struggling, but it didn't happen by itself. Like we are living on one globe, so every one of you can do uh, his share. It worked in South Africa. It can be work. Uh, it can work here. And of course, I'm talking about BDS. And uh, every one of you has something to do. So maybe we can see that the light at the, at the end of the tunnel. Mm. Thank you. So I want to thank you all for being here, and thank you both. And could you just share, there's some cards outside on the desk about the film where you can learn more, but the website, just so people can go, you know, if they want to learn more or see what happens with the film, because I think it's going to be traveling and going other places, just to give people a reference. Absolutely. So the official, um, the official film website is at www.wanted18.com. Um, there's also a website through Just Vision. It's www.justvision.org backslash wanted18. Um, if you're interested in staying in touch, um, please do email us. Um, you can reach out to me directly at sahad at justvision.org. That's S-U-H-A-D at justvision.org. And I'll stick around after the screening um, to be in touch with all of you um, who are interested in diving in a little bit more. Just Vision is partnering with Kino Lorber as well as Intuitive <laughs> Pictures in the United States to ensure that the film is being screened in the United States. Um, the National Film Board of Canada oversees the rights for um, the broader international community, but we're in very close touch and we'll make sure that any inquiries um, make their way uh, to the National Film Board of Canada and we'll be in touch and following up. So if you want to screen the film in your communities, mm -hmm. exactly. harass her. Yes. <laughs> or push for it to be on the television as well. So but thank you so much, both of you, for being here to share the stories. Thank you all again for coming. And um, yeah. <laughs>